Hi, you're on the Bible Forum. Do you know how to identify a New Testament church? Some of you struggle finding a church. And I understand the struggle. Uh, because it isn't just, I want a church that I can trust, that I know the Bible is going to be taught properly. But it's also having to do with the social dynamic and with the cultural dynamic and, and just with the kinds of things that, that happen and so forth. But my friend Ken Symes, who's a, a missionary to the Jews, uh, has been for the last 150 years, uh, and is in, in semi-retirement in his mid-80s, uh, working from something called Sar Shalom Ministries in Florida, has written a book, How to Identify a New Testament Church. It's for Gentiles, it's for Jews as well. And I wanted to read to you a couple of excerpts from it. The idea here is that if you are not a contributor and you'd still like the book, let me know. Ken writes, recently I was speaking with a man probably in his early 60s. I know him to be a born-again believer. I have known him for many years. Until just a few years ago, he was active in what I believe to be a fundamental church. It concerned me that he was no longer involved in a local church. As we talked, I learned that he was still actively witnessing and sharing the gospel. I sensed that he was making a valid effort to stay in fellowship with the Lord. We talked about why he was no longer involved with a local church. He said, I find most local churches are no longer functioning as what I believe to be a true New Testament local church. As we talked farther, further, I determined that his understanding of what a New Testament church was supposed to, was supposed to be was right on target as far as he went with it. He went on and shared with me what he sees in most local churches today is that they have lost their biblical vision of what a local church should be. And with this, I could not disagree. He admitted there were probably are still few local fellowships out there that are standing on and practicing uh, what the Bible teaches regarding what a New Testament local church should be. But he was so turned off that he had lost any desire to try to locate a local church where he could comfortably be a part. I pointed out to him that it is God's plan for believers to be an active part of a sound local church, sharing with him Hebrews 10, verses 19 through 25. His response was that anywhere that two or three believers gather together constitute a church. Now, though there is some truth in that, the New Testament church, as we find in the book of Acts and Ephesians, was much more. Clearly, it's an organized fellowship of believers led, essentially, by a pastor. In Acts 6, 1 through 7, we see the organization. There are those who primarily, who primary, whose primary responsibility is the preaching and teaching of the Word of God and others who assumed other responsibilities. When Barnabas found Saul, he took him to Antioch, and it came to pass, Acts eleven twenty six, that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. This demonstrates an organized fellowship where the believers regularly met, not only for worship, but for service. There are a number of other passages that reinforce that idea. There are many folks who believe themselves to be Christians, and they may be, who use the Hebrews 10 passage as an excuse to not become involved in an organized church. The problem is that they only see half of what the church is called out to be. They see it only as a place of worship. In this sense, it's true that two or three could gather together to worship the Lord, but most of those using this excuse for not participating in a biblical local church are not even doing that. A true biblical local church gathers for worship, but they also join together to serve the Lord. According to Hebrews 10, they gather to strengthen their faith, verse 23. Further, they meet to encourage one another to love and to be involved in doing good works, verse 24. To exhort is to admonish to, or to advise. In the positive sense, each member is called to encourage other members as they walk in the faith. In John 14, 23, Jesus is recorded as saying, If a man love me, 
he will keep my words. And in this a believer is blessed. And my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. In John 15, 12, Jesus said, This is my commandment, that ye love one another, as I have loved you. The word translated love is agape, which is God's love, unconditional love, giving without expecting anything in return. With the Spirit, we are called to exhort one another. And this takes an organized church. Two or three believers, in one sense, do constitute a church. But that's not the church described in the book of Acts. The intended purpose of this book is to help the reader understand what the Bible clearly teaches about a believer's involvement in a local church and what the Bible teaches about what a New Testament local church is. This gives the reader foundational information so that he, she, will be able to determine whether or not a particular church is truly a New Testament church, local church, worthy of his or her participation and support. At the very outset of this treatise, it may be stated that there is no perfect local church because they are made up of imperfect people. Every local church has its issues. Our purpose is not to criticize, but to establish what constitutes a biblically maturing New Testament local church. We desire to present a very clear goal for every local church to seek to attain. We also want to give believers the information to determine if a particular local church adheres to to at least the fundamentals as clearly laid out in God's Word. It's an interesting fact that with all of the formal biblical education I have received over the years, I was never specifically taught what a biblical New Testament local church should be. I wonder how many pastors today have a significant depth of understanding of what the Bible teaches on this subject. This deficit helps create the problems that the local church faces today. After all, how can we know how to build that which we do not really understand? We must also understand at the outset of this treatise that God's purpose in creating man was for fellowship, as this is a fundamental Bible truth. Genesis chapter 2, Psalm 16. Psalm 16, 11 speaks of why the relationship should be important to us. Thou wilt show me the path of life, the psalmist says. In thy presence is fullness of joy, and at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. In John 14, 23, Jesus is reported saying, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Now please note that the Greek word translated love is agapao, agapeo, depicting God's love, which is unconditional. So what Jesus is saying here is that if we will love him unconditionally, the result will be personal fellowship with him. Remember, Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship. Religion is a man's effort to find and please God's ritual, rules, the goal of which is to earn one's way to eternal life, a humanly impossible task. Regarding religion, the Bible states, but we are all as unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses, all our good works are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. In Isaiah 57, 12, God stated, I will declare thy righteousness and thy works, for they shall not profit thee. Paul stated it this way in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Religion does not save. The true God created man for fellowship, which results in fullness of joy and pleasures that go into eternity. And that fellowship is to be not only with God, but also with other believers. Should this not be the heart of the local church? Only God can overcome on our behalf the wages of sin. And only God can transform a new believer into the image of his dear son. This is important for us to understand if we're going to understand why God created the local church and laid out his plan for its existing as he has done. So let us now begin our study of what God teaches us about the New Testament local church. It's a short book. 
won't take you very long to read. I think altogether 60 pages. And you can see it's not a great big book. It's not thick. I really appreciate if you get one of these books in the mail. Let me know what you think. If you'd like to have one, let me know.